This is Reverend Kirk Lawton, minister at Ocean Lakes Family Campground, and this is our podcast. Our prayer is that this message may enrich your life as you find God especially meaningful to you. Thank you for worshiping with us. On this Labor Day Sunday, there are no doubt many preachers throughout the land who will be speaking on subjects which extol the virtues of honest labor, making much of the fact that the Bible teaches that we are to labor and to do this with dignity. It is true that our Lord does expect this of us, and this is a note which needs to be sounded in a day when there's so many who seem to think that the thing to do is to avoid work. There are those who feel that they can make more money by not working than they can by working. This warped thinking, along with government handouts, is one reason why we are now experiencing the labor shortage in our nation. Far too many people have the mistaken idea that I am entitled to what you have earned. But this is not my subject this morning. I want us today to reverse that emphasis somewhat and look at the other side of the work ethic as we examine what has become another problem in our society. I want you to think with me, therefore, on the subject workaholics and the Christian faith. The word workaholic is one which was claimed to be coined by one of my former professors at the seminary I attended in Louisville, Kentucky. His name is Dr. Wayne Oates. I'm, in fact, indebted to Dr. Oates for much uh, that I will be sharing with you this morning. Dr. Oates defined the workaholic as a person whose involvement in work has become so excessive that it disturbs or interferes with his bodily health, personal happiness, interpersonal relations, and social functioning. Strangely enough, our society both frowns upon and tries to help those who are alcoholics and drug addicts. But we have not yet come to see the workaholic as a person who likewise needs to reevaluate life and make some adjustments in order to have a meaningful and fulfilling existence. There are several, there are several warning signs that one may be, coming, be becoming a workaholic. One person may talk a lot about how much more work he has to do than others at the office. Then there may be a pattern of actually staying on the job later and later each evening. Another sign that things are going wrong is that this person is unable to say no to people who want his services. If this person is a wage earner, he may even thrive on working more than one job even seemed to do it well for a a time. One man who was working two shifts, six days per week, came to the point where he was able to say, I have always said I will not stop until I am a $100,000 a year man. But now I've come to see that I'm not really a $100,000 a year man. I'm a $50,000 man who works two shifts. The problem with all this overemphasis upon work is that God did not create create us to be superhumans who can continue this indefinitely. Eventually, there comes a break. It might be a physical breakdown or it might take other forms. One man who was held in high esteem in the community by everybody by trying to be all things to all people came to realize one day that He was out of touch with his 12-year-old son, who had started now using amphetamines, marijuana, and alcohol. Another young man whose work caused him to be away from home almost all of each week, he was home only on weekends, came to realize that his workaholism had caused him to sacrifice his family. No longer did he have a wife at home who loved him, for they had nothing in common, never being together. Also, the temptation for her to find some companionship while he was gone got to be too great for her. Of course, on the surface, he was working for his wife and family. But when it became excessive, 
he lost what he thought was his greatest love, his family. And it came to the place that he even said to his wife, if I have to give up either you or my work, I can't quit my job. It's too good a job. I'm saying this morning that the Christian faith has more to offer than that. This is not the way God intended that we should live. You may already be thinking on the other side of the coin saying to yourself, what, where would we be without these workaholics in our society today? Well, I'll readily admit that there's much to be said for them. The workaholic's way of life is considered in America to be, one, a, a religious virtue, two, a form of patriotism, three, the way to win friends and influence people, and four, the way to be healthy, wealthy, and wise. In short, the workaholic is often looked up to as the ideal person, the example, the success story. Industry thrives on workaholics, those who will sell their very soul to their business. Tennessee Ernie Ford had that, you remember, in this song, another day older and deeper in debt. I owe my soul to the company store. One executive remarked, I remember when there was such a good morale in our company that you could come by here any night and you could find men burning the midnight oil in their work. But this is no longer the case. And this executive said, I hope we can get back to that spirit. Dr. Wayne Oates, whom I mentioned earlier, told about meeting a meeting of a mental health society in which the speaker was an outstanding psychiatrist. In his remarks, he had something to say about the necessity of proper balance between work and play, laughter and seriousness. And after he had finished speaking, an award was given to the outstanding mental health worker in the state hospital system. And as they were praising this man, one of the things that was said of him was that he was so great, he had not even taken a vacation for several years. Uh, once again, I must say that the older I get, and hopefully somewhat wiser, the more I'm finding the need to fall back on what God expects of us and intends to receive from us rather than burning ourselves out prematurely with an obsession with workaholism. I could go on talking about the problem, describing the workaholic in many ways, both men and women, by the way, but I want us now to move on quickly to the second part of what we're considering as our subject. What does our Christian faith have to do with this situation? One of the most obvious ways in which this spirit of workaholism shows up is in work and the organized church. You know the old story about two people who were discussing the possibility of joining a certain Baptist church. Of course, it could well have been a church of another denomination also. One man seemed to be all for joining that Baptist church, but the other one, knowing all the committees and the meetings and the activities that Baptists were noted for, said, well, I would like to be a member of that church, but I don't think I can be a Baptist because I, I just don't think I'm physically up to it. <laughs> Somebody has put this idea into the words of a little poem also. It goes like this. Mary had a little lamb. It would have been a sheep, but one day it joined a Baptist church and died from lack of sleep. <laughs> we smile at the thought of much activity which goes on in connection with the church life of any denomination. But those who are vitally involved in the life of any active church know how true this really can be. The time may well come, if it has not already arrived, when we need to sit down, take stock of ourselves, asking if perhaps we can't accomplish the same or even greater goals by doing things in different ways which do not require our members, some of them, to become religious workaholics. Do you know that it's actually possible for a person to make a God, and that's with a small g now, out of church activity? One mother once brought her 14-year-old son to the preacher 
after a service on Sunday evening they had attended. She said to the pastor, what am I going to do with my son Gordon? He would not come to that meeting at church this afternoon that he was supposed to come to. He wanted to play with some of his friends instead. He got mad with me and he said, church, church, church. That's all I hear, mama. Now, preacher, what do you think of him? Asked the irate mother. The little fellow was terribly embarrassed for her mother talking about him in front of the preacher like this. But the pastor, who had insight as well as love for the Lord and his church, re responded by saying to this lady, or to the son actually, Gordon, I know exactly how you feel. All I hear is church, church, church. And sometimes I get tired too, Gordon. And when I get real tired of church the next time, I'm coming to see you because I know you'll understand how I feel. Yes, God has an understanding of how we feel. And we have to be very careful that we not let church make us religious workaholics. After this conversation with the, the mother, the preacher turned to the mother and he, he said to her, Ma'am, anybody who has never gotten tired of church just never has been to church very much. Now folks, what I have just said is not intended to be ammunition for those Christmas and Easter attenders who want another excuse for not attending church. What I am saying is that we need to be honest about our feelings. Sometimes openly admit that it's quite possible to become so obsessed with even church attendance that we get right intolerant about those who do not come every time we do. That is religious workaholism, and it is a perversion of something good. How wonderful it is, though, to know that God does not give us up when we go astray. Yes, we all sin. We daily fall short of the plan God has for our lives, but he has ways of helping us. One way in which God helps the workaholic is by giving him some warnings. Even a heart attack or some other type of disability can be a blessing from God in disguise, a way God has of letting us be on our backs so we can look up again. This physical body can stand only so much. I like what Dr. Richard Cabot, the distinguished physician at Massachusetts General Hospital used to say, the body has more sense than the mind. That is so true. A good doctor friend, local doctor friend of mine, Dr. Jim Graham, says the same thing. In other words, he says, your mind will play tricks on you, but your body will always tell you the truth. You see, God has been trying to tell us ever since he set the example in creating the world that we are not exempt from the need for rest. God created the world in six days and then he rested. Why was that? Was it because God was so tired? I think not. Rather, he was showing us that there needs to be a proper balance between work and rest. Those who leave the rest periods out of life don't really work any better. They eventually cause chaos and the work they do is less and more poorly done. Let me ask you, have you ever stopped to think of how your favorite musical number would be if there were no rests in it? Sometimes you might just try singing a song without any rest or stops for a breath. Well, you know I'm not a soloist, but let me, give you, <laughs> let me try to give you an example of what, what I'm talking about, the need for a rest in a song. Let's take a very familiar song, Amazing Grace, without the rests in it. It goes like this. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. Well, not only because that's the preacher singing, but you've never heard that song butchered so poorly as I just did. The musician's rest in any music is just as vital to beautiful music as is the production of sounds. The Roman Catholic Church reveres Joseph the earthly father of Jesus, as a saint. They have a hymn which they sing to Joseph, one stanza of which goes like this. Joseph, workman's 
inspiration, man of faith and charity, make us honest, faithful, strong, with Christ, true liberty. Make our labor and our leisure fruitful to eternity. Those are good words. The idea of labor and leisure, both being fruitful to eternal life, is a truth that we all need to recapture. <coughs> now, if you've noticed carefully, you're aware of the fact that up to this point, I have not as yet referred to a particular verse from the Bible. Let me assure you that all I have said this morning has been biblically based in thought. Quite frankly, the Bible has so many verses about the subject of work until I've been somewhat at a loss to choose only one. But I do want to share a verse with you. It's from the Old Testament, from the Ten Commandments, but not from the Exodus account, which we usually use. It's from another account of the Ten Commandments over in Deuteronomy chapter 5. Let me read this in the contemporary English version, beginning with verse 12. Show respect for the Sabbath day. It belongs to me. You have six days when you can do your work, but the seventh day of the week belongs to me, your God. Then skipping down to verse 15. This special day of rest will remind you that I reached out my mighty arm and rescued you from slavery in Egypt. You see, the gospel is still the good news. It's the good news that Jesus came to bring, that we are no longer slaves. We are free in Christ. This is exactly what Jesus was talking about in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 6 when he said, So don't be anxious about tomorrow. God will take care of your tomorrow too. Live one day at a time. Matthew 6, 34. And there's also in that same chapter the beautiful promise of Jesus who said, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things should be added unto you. <coughs> if God is not worrying about these things that make us so frantic, then why do we worry? One preacher told of an experience he had in the airport in Birmingham, Alabama. He had gotten to the airport late and was running wildly past other people in the concourse trying to catch his flight. He ran past two men who called out to him saying, Hey, mister, don't hurry. Preacher stopped suddenly, turned around and said, Why not hurry? I've got to catch my flight. One of the other two men then answered, You don't need to hurry. We are the pilots on your flight. Perhaps as you look at your life today, you'll admit that you do need freedom. For you, it may be this matter of being a workaholic. Or it may be a need to be free from some other form of bondage that you're in. If you've not turned your life over to Jesus, then you're still a slave. But beginning today, right now, you can be free. Will you accept it? Lord Jesus, give us the freedom that you came to this earth to bring. and Help us to be willing, O oh God, to follow you and to know that the Bible has definite teachings on us, for us, on this subject of workaholism. Make us free in Jesus, we pray. Amen.